There we go. Waiting on it, waiting on it. There it is. Good evening. Welcome to Anchor Church. I'm glad that you're here with us, whether you're in the room, whether you're online. Glad you are here. Glad you are here. Glad. <laughs> We have a small enough group. We'll just say that to everybody this evening. Hope you're doing well. We're going to continue our series on the, uh, the parables. We're going in order. We're on the sixth parable tonight. Some weeks we do more than one parable, so we're not that many weeks in, but we're that many parables in at this point. And um, this evening, I'm looking forward to this one. This is one of my favorites. This is the one that I, I'm in danger of potentially preaching before we're done, um, but that's just kind of how some of these go. I, I love this story. Um if you're online, thank you for joining us. If you're interested in uh, interested in giving, we've got a link down below the video. You can do that. Um, it's tax free. It does not come to me. It's not my money. It's money that goes to Anchor Church, so that we can continue to be uh, be an existing entity, um, either in person or online, and all that stuff. So, it goes to church, not to me. It's tax deductible. You get a receipt for it at the end of the year, and that is that. With all that said, let's go tonight. Um, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter seven, verses forty one. Or sorry, verses 36 through 48 is where we are. I'm going to be reading it in sections, though, because I want to understand it in some pieces. We're looking at it tonight. Uh, I'll give you some time to, to get there. If you're looking for that, I'll pray for us this evening, and, and we'll hear what the Lord says to us tonight. Father, I thank you tonight for the chance to be with your people. I'm glad that we're gathered, some of us here, some of us online, even some of us watching later. I'm just grateful that you give us the opportunity to gather and a chance that we can hear from your word. And I pray that tonight you will speak to us through it, that I'll speak clearly, that your people will hear, that they'll hear what you intended, that there won't be any distortions or anything that get between your word and your people as we as we gather to hear what you would say to us. Be with us tonight and let us walk out of here better equipped to bring you glory than we were when we got here in your name. Amen. So we've looked at several parables, and we're looking at them from different different perspectives. Tonight, we're just looking at one perspective. There, we're going to look at at Luke's account of a of a money lender. That's Jesus telling the parable. But let's look at the parable first. Just Luke seven forty one through forty three. Those couple of verses is where we'll start. Jesus is speaking, and he says, "A creditor had two debtors. One owed owed five hundred denarii, the other fifty. And since they could not pay it back." He graciously forgave them both. That's important. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered him, I suppose the one he forgave more. You've judged correctly, he told him. So that's the parable we're looking at tonight. Um, you've likely heard that parable, but more than probably any other one, understanding the context is very important in this one, so we'll know exactly what's being said. We need to look at the circumstances where it was happening and the people that Jesus is talking to. Um, you may have already guessed where this is from, even if you've not heard the par or if you've not heard the parable recently, or don't know the the reference, because I put a uh, a little bit of a teaser online. I said we're we're going to talk about prostitutes and hospitality and social justice and people who have just totally missed the point. That probably puts this in context for you. But let's back up a little bit. We heard the, heard that's the parable, and we'll get to it. But let's look at where we are. If you back up to verse thirty six, we're going to look at verses thirty six and thirty eight. One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to eat with him. That's the Simon we're talking about from, from the parable. He entered the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table, and a woman in the town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of fragrant oil and stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to wash, Lord help me, began to wash his feet with her tears. And she wiped his feet with the hair of her head, kissing them and anointing them with the fragrant oil probably heard this story. The woman we, we find out, uh, if you study this or if you read it in the original King James, you find out this woman was a prostitute. She was not just any woman. She was considered a, a low class, uh, even among sinners, a low class person, someone who was not very valuable as a human being, who was tremendously unclean, a terrible sinner in the eyes of even other sinners. And this Pharisee, Simon, has invited Jesus to eat with him, and this would have been a big event. It would have been a big deal. We've gotten the very important teacher has gotten another very important teacher to come and meet with him at his house. So it would have been a big deal. And it says Jesus entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Notice that's all that happened because this becomes important later. Jesus shows up, and he just walks in, and he goes to the table, and he reclines. Now, that was normal that they would recline. You sit down when you're comfortable. You prop yourself up on one arm or prop yourself up on some pillows and the table would have been close to the floor 
And so he just walks in and begins to sit down. And as he sits down at the table and reclines and gets comfortable, this woman comes up and just begins to wash his feet. And that jar of oil, if you've heard this story before, we, we speculate would have cost about what one year's wages would have cost someone. If you can imagine taking an entire year's worth of what you have made and using it for one event, that tells you how important and precious the presence of Jesus was to this woman. And so here's the, this is the scene we have when Jesus begins to tell this parable. Now, in order to understand, again, context, what we're dealing with here is the attitudes about the underclass in biblical times. Not only was this woman a prostitute, but she was a poor person who has come into the house of a, a rich and well-off man, a Pharisee who was well-established. The underclass, the lower class people, the kind of people that this woman happened to be a, a, a member of, they tended to congregate in large cities. You go to large cities and you have a whole lot of poor people. And this is the way it was in biblical times. The, poor, the underclass or the what was often just referred to as the poor, it didn't just mean people that were financially destitute. It meant poor in spirit. It meant poor in, in their means beyond just their, their money. It would have included, yes, people who were financially poor, but also people that were chronically ill. It would have included disabled people lepers, people that had incurable diseases. It would have included people who were blind, people who were emotionally unstable. Widows, orphans, and political refugees would have all been considered this underclass of poor people that were looked down on and didn't have a whole lot of status or esteem in Jesus' society. They were people that were, for the most part, unable to improve their circumstances or un unable to improve their status. Some of them, that was because they were financially poor. They couldn't get any better off because they didn't have the money to buy nicer things and do better for themselves. Some of them were that way because of their lack of government or religious provisions. The government and the church, quite frankly, in this time, was not providing for people in the way that Scripture or that even we today would look at and say, we should take care of the less fortunate. Um, there were people who had no family, so I'm blind and I can't work for myself and I've got no family to help care for me, so I have become a member of the underclass because if I don't work, I don't eat. I can't take care of myself. I'm reliant upon other people. Some of these people would have just had lack of personal or political connections. I've got no family. I've got no friends. I've got nobody to keep me safe. We said political refugees, people that may have come from other places because there was an issue there and there was no protection for them. And they came here and they've got no political allies. So I'm safe because I've made it inside the city limits here, but I've got nobody to really help me out of my situation so I can go home again. So I've fled where I used to live with nothing more than what I have on my back and what I can carry. So this is the group of people. Most of them ended up providing for themselves by begging, by becoming thieves, by doing odd jobs, you know, just being a handyman of some sort, um, selling themselves for slaves, which they often did long-term or short-term. I will work for you in exchange for food, or if you will loan me an amount of money, I will work for you until it's paid off. But because they don't have any way to sustain themselves, that becomes a lifestyle for some of these people, that they have sold themselves into slavery. Or like this woman that we learned about, they sell themselves as prostitutes, because then I can support myself with what means I have. But it comes, even if it's financially profitable, at the expense of my social standing. This group of people, that's where I get emotional because this is my own heart. This demographic was the primary focus of Jesus' ministry. This group of people, the poor, the chronically ill, the disabled, the lepers, the blind, the emotionally unstable, the widows, the orphans, the political refugees, the prostitutes, the slaves. This group of people that were called poor. That's who Jesus focused his ministry on. It doesn't mean he was not making the gospel available to everyone and didn't do what he did for everybody, but he saw these needy people, and that's who he preached to the most often. That's who he taught the most often. That's who he spent the most time with. A lot of people in that group were skeptical of Jesus because it was so common for everyone else to take advantage of them. If you put yourself in the context of this story, in the context of Jesus' ministry, he would show up to this group of people who are in need, and there is nobody better prepared to take care of their problems. But they have been treated so poorly by the government, and by the rich, and by the church. 
it was so common for those groups of people to take advantage of them that they didn't at first trust him. It took some time. We spend a lot of time talking about how the Pharisees opposed Jesus, but Jesus had a hard row to hoe, so to speak, in trying to work with this group of people because they had been treated badly by everyone else that was supposed to be in place to help them. It was such a common practice for the government, the rich, and the church to take advantage of these people. That they would take advantage of them by saying, what can you do for me? How can you help us? What will you do to help our numbers, help us produce, make us feel good about ourselves, make us physically feel good? And they would do those things, but then would ignore the actual needs the people had. What can you do for us? We can't do anything for you, though. No wonder they were skeptical of Jesus when he showed up and said, I want to help you in a way that no one else ever has. And I don't want anything from you. Oh, yeah, right. It reminds me of this quote from Ronald Reagan. He says, the, the most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> I love that quote. And that's, that's the kind of situation that these people are, are living in. So they're, they're skeptical when Jesus says, hi, I'm, I'm here from heaven. I'm the son of God and I'd like to help you. Jesus' genuine interest in this group of people made him a curiosity. And it took some time for him to be able to be accepted by this group of people. And then oddly enough, that very same thing, his genuine pure interest in this group of marginalized people is the reason he began to be rejected by the church and by the government because they didn't understand why do you care about them? Of all the people you could pick, here we are, powerful, rich, influential. Why would you not want to start with us? And then that could just work its way out into society wasn't the approach Jesus took. So here's the group Jesus is ministering to. Here's who this woman is, and she's wandered into Simon's house and begins to tend to the Savior, to the Son of God. And Simon has something to say about this. In verse 39 and 40, just before we get to the actual parable, the Pharisee who invited him, Simon, saw this and he said to himself, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is that's touching him. She's a sinner. And Jesus replied to him. Now, I love that by itself because Simon said this to himself as if he were thinking to himself and no one could hear. And Jesus replies out loud with words. Jesus heard what he was thinking. Simon didn't have to do anything or say anything. God knows what you're thinking. We don't have to go out and do the bad thing. We don't have to curl our lip up. We don't have to wrinkle our nose. We don't have to turn our shoulder. The Lord knows what we said quietly in our hearts when we encountered the people that he most wanted to minister to. And he speaks his reply, not privately and quietly, as Simon thought to himself. Jesus replies out loud to what he was thinking and what was in his heart and says, Simon, I have something I'd like to say to you. I have a feeling that though this may have been kind, it may not have come out as very nice. I don't think it was Simon. I'd like to tell you something. Because Jesus is responding to the heart and attitude of a man toward the people that Jesus has come and spent the most time with and has the greatest heart for that we've seen demonstrated in his ministry up to this point. I expect it was a little more firm. And Simon, being a very bold man, says, teacher, say it. I have to wonder, was it a challenge? Or was he really eager to hear what Jesus might have to say? Did he even realize that Jesus had heard him? Because he said this to himself, and Jesus didn't say, Simon, I heard what you said. He just says, Simon, I'd like to say something to you. And Simon says, teacher, say it. That phrase that Simon uses there, if you are who you say you are, you would... You wouldn't minister to these people. If you are who you say you are, you wouldn't be where they are, and you wouldn't let them be near you. It breaks my heart to think what the Lord would think if he hears what we think when we get around the kind of people that he's asked us to minister to sometimes. And that doesn't always mean that there's someone homeless who smells bad. It might be someone who's obnoxious and got a personality that you don't like being around. It may be somebody that has offended you in some way. It may be some really important person that you should be respectful of, but you don't feel they deserve it because of their politics or something that they've said on television. And the Lord says, 
I've came for the poor, and those are the people that are separated from me and from my goodness. If he heard us, and he could hear what we think, <laughs> and what we're saying is, I don't know why God would minister to those people. Why does he reach out to them? I don't know why I should have to minister to those people and reach out to them. Why should I care what they say or who they are or what they think? If you are who you say you are, why would you be near them? Why would you die for them? Why would you care about them? And Jesus has something to say about that when he hears it. The church as a whole has kind of lost our way when we approach people that are in need. Whether that be people that are poor and desperate or whether they're just lost. A lot of times our response to the people that Jesus is most eagerly trying to reach is that we want to hold an event once or twice a year so we can feel good about ourselves. We want to do some sort of charity event or we want to do a big outreach and some evangelism thing in a tent somewhere that draws a lot of attention and we want to do that a couple of times a year seasonally and say we've done a great thing to reach our community and we've done a great thing for the kingdom of God. Or sometimes we want to take money and just give it to a cause and we want to say I'm going to give to this missionary or this evangelist and I'm going to let them go do the great work of God and that's how we participated. Or we want to say that we've given some money to a local food bank and that's how we're taking care of the poor and needy in our community. Or sometimes we just want to stand in the pulpit and we want to say we're going to vote for the right political party because they've got some great ideas on how to take care of these things that are wrong. And by showing up to vote and being politically active, that's how we're going to do our part for the kingdom of God. And I have to say, I think that must break God's heart because he didn't ask us to outsource the work of the kingdom. He said, you go and preach and teach and baptize. Jesus did not send other people to do his work until the time came that he was leaving. And he said, now you get to be my hands and feet. The demonstration was that he was right there with those groups of people, no matter who they were. We don't get to outsource the work of the kingdom of God, not to the government and not to some other agency and not to some other group of people who have a different ministry than us. We can't reduce charity to an event and still call ourselves disciples. We can't reduce evangelism to an event and call ourselves disciples. Charitable activity and evangelism are a lifestyle. They are ongoing practices, and they are a condition of our heart and spirit that we should have the mind of Christ if we want to say, I'm a disciple of his. If you look at James 1.27, it speaks specifically about this social justice idea. James says, pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Pure and undefiled religion is this, to look after those marginalized people who can't care for themselves and to keep yourself pure in heart before God, unstained by the world. That doesn't mean that we live with our wallets open, but it does mean that our hearts and our attitudes have to be open to even the people that we would say are the least of these. And we have to be careful who we call the least of these because some of those who are the least are spiritually poor, even if they're financially well off. Some of them are morally bankrupt and they don't know it because no one's taken the time to minister to them. And we have to live with our hearts open to those people. In fact, there's another parable where Jesus uses those very words about tending to the needs of those who have gone unmet by the world at large. He uses that phrase, the least of these. This is a parable we'll talk about later. Um, but Matthew 25, 40, Jesus says, I assure you, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you've done it for me. That was the ministry of Jesus, was finding the people who needed him most and meeting their need. You see that not just in the fact that he ministered to these marginalized people. You see it when he meets a Pharisee in the middle of the night who's actually interested in what he has to say. You see it in the fact that he's meeting Simon at his house even today in the story that we're reading. He's looking for the people who need him most that would receive him and listen. That's the least of these. And we have to be more proactive and we have to do a better job as Christians or we have to stop pretending that we're doing well. That's the ministry of Jesus. And these are the people that he ministered to. He ministered to the underclass and the marginalized and the people who were the least important and who were the most needy. And knowing that's the context that we're in tonight, Simon has this woman come into his house and 
has these thoughts about her and Jesus has something to say about it. And then we look at the parable itself and we see something fairly straightforward in that. A creditor had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii, the other 50. Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, I suppose the one he forgave more. You've judged correctly, he told him. The parable is fairly simple to understand. But I fear when we read this that we and Simon sometimes miss the point. The parable just simply means the more you've been forgiven, the greater your love for the one who's forgiven you. The more that the Lord has, has forgiven you of, the more, the more injustice <laughs> that the Lord has rescued you from, or rather the more justice that you deserve that the Lord has rescued you from, the, the greater your love for him. The person who was forgiven more money has a bigger debt and they have more to be grateful for. That seems pretty straightforward, but there's a much bigger picture than that happening here. If you look at verse, verses 44 through 46, we get a picture of the big picture. Turning to the woman, Jesus says to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she with her tears has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she's anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Now, Jesus is pointing out something to Simon here. He's explained, here's the parable, and Simon, he seems to get it. Okay, the one who's been forgiven the most has the most to be grateful for. And then Jesus says, let's look at the difference between you and this person. And it's very different than what you might expect. Because he points out to Simon, first of all, that no servant was provided to wash his feet when he came to the house. Normally when you've traveled wearing only sandals in a place that's dusty and dirty and in a really nice place, they would have had cobblestone streets that are still dirty. Your feet would be gross. There's perhaps been pebbles in your shoe. Your sandals tend to take on the dust and there would be a layer of them. And as you came into the house, it would be customary and normal that you would clean your feet to keep the inside of the house from getting dirty and simply to be refreshed and feel comfortable in the home where you've been invited to dinner. Simon didn't do this for him. He says, there was no greeting. He says, you didn't kiss me. You didn't greet me when I arrived. And I pointed that out to you when we first read the, the story here. It says Jesus just walked in and reclined at the table. It doesn't say that Jesus came in and was greeted and led. He simply just walked in and sat down. He wasn't greeted when he arrived. He also wasn't anointed or refreshed with oil. It was a fairly common thing in this day that Jesus, Jesus anyone who arrived at someone's home, they're hot, they're sweaty, they may not smell very good. It would be normal to refresh them by perhaps rinsing them in it with some clean water and giving them some fresh oil to cover up the smells of, of sweat and dirt from the road and just, again, make them feel refreshed and more comfortable and to make them more pleasant to be around if there were any other guests. These are common, basic Jewish customs that would have happened when someone arrived at your home. And by the standard of those Jewish customs, Simon had been rude, he had been ungracious, and he had been selfish in his invitation to Jesus. How often do we do this ourselves? <coughs> we invite Jesus to participate in church. Come be part of our church service, Lord. Come be part of my life or come be part of my home and hang out with me and my family. But we do it on our own terms. Here's what we've decided is going to happen. You can show up. We would, we would be honored if you would come and be part of what we're doing. And we're more interested when we do that in what he's going to contribute to the circumstances than we are the opportunity to give him what he deserves when he shows up. None of the basic needs of Jesus as a guest had been met. Simon ignored every basic cultural human courtesy of the day. Not one of the things he should have done as a good host got observed. And I'm not saying he wasn't fancy enough. It's not that he needed to put on a big spread or a big display. He certainly probably could have given who he was. But we're not saying he didn't make it extravagant enough. We're saying he didn't even do the bare minimum when Jesus showed up. What he was interested in as posing, or was to pose as an important man while he invited an important guest into the house. 
what Jesus brought to him from his perspective was some esteem and some recognition. And he offered Jesus nothing in return. Simon was trying to use Jesus' importance to bolster his own, and he entirely missed the opportunity to give Jesus the honor that Jesus deserves, and instead neglected the basic hospitality of a common house guest. Jesus says, this is how you treated me, but look at what the woman did. She's done for me all of the things that you should have done, and she doesn't even live here. And she's gone above the bare minimum because you didn't even give me olive oil and she's brought something fragrant that would have taken time to create and would have been extremely costly, not just the basic stuff you would give any guest that walked in the door. Jesus says, Simon, consider this woman. But Simon, when he considered the woman initially, he just saw her as a sinner. Not as a woman who was honoring the Lord for what he had done for her. He simply saw her for what was wrong in her life. Simon makes this terrible social mistake of first not giving Jesus the courtesy he deserves as a guest, and then he becomes critical of the very people that Jesus targeted for ministry. He takes the thing that's most important to Jesus, and he essentially insults her right in front of him. And he makes it very clear that he thinks more highly of himself than he does of the people that Jesus says, I came to seek and save. And if that hasn't gone far enough, if you don't think that's insulting and rude enough that this is the heart of the man who's invited Jesus, Simon goes one further and he becomes critical of Jesus's identity and authority and purpose because Jesus allowed a sinner to do for him what Simon neglected to do. Oh, how that hurts. Not just when I think Simon, but when I look at my own life and I look at the church and I look at people who call themselves saved and I look at the group of people I call my friends and we say we're disciples and we're trying to seek after Christ and then I think how often have I just failed to bring Jesus the basic common necessities that he deserves for showing up at my house and in my heart and in my church? How often have I spoken poorly even in my heart of the people that Jesus said my heart should be open to most of all? Simon and we need some perspective. And we get it in verses 47 and 48 as we come to an end of this parable. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, and that's why she loves so much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. The greatest gift that he could give, he bestows upon the lowest person there, the one who's looked down on and scorned and treated poorly. But if we see him from the or see her from the perspective of Christ, we see the one who did what was proper and right and went above and beyond even at her own great expense, because she saw Jesus for who he was and knew what he had done for her. What's very interesting here, I told you when we first saw the parable, we look at the, the parable of the money lender. Two men owed the money lender two different amounts. And I told you to remember he forgave them both. We look at this situation and Jesus was still kind and courteous to Simon, though he had neglected to do the things that were right and proper before him. Jesus forgave Simon for his small discourtesies. And Simon showed him no love and no respect in return. He didn't even acknowledge what Jesus had done because he wasn't aware of his own faults. He completely missed the point. Jesus calls Simon out, and when Simon showed such great disrespect for this woman, he pointed out that this woman has demonstrated far greater love for me than you have, sir. What's the point of me harping on this and pulling it or saying it over and over so many ways? It's this. We're talking about God's grace and God's forgiveness and our own awareness of it in our own lives and, our, and the availability of it to everybody that we meet and see. Ultimately, we know God forgives everyone who will repent and believe. Everyone, everyone, 
even those people that you're thinking right now, how could he? And I have some in my life, and I'm sure you have some in yours. How could he? Really, he'll forgive people that have done those things? Yes. It's a good thing I'm not him. Ultimately, God forgives everyone that repents and believes. In the parable, the money lender forgave both debts. At dinner, Jesus forgives both Simon's lack of courtesy, but also the prostitute's great sins. What we really see here is a difference in the attitude and awareness of these people. And more than likely, that's the thing that most applies to us. How aware are we of where we fit in this picture when we stand next to the Lord? The problem we have is that good people, people who think themselves, I'm a good person, I try hard, I try to be a good Christian, I try to be a good disciple, I'm following him the best I can. Good people often have difficulty with two things. The first one is appreciating the passion of the people who have been forgiven much. It can look like they're crazy. It can look like they're going overboard. It can look like it's way too much. Do you really need to, I mean, a year's worth of wages, you put all of that on the feet? Why would you, I mean, you could have done so many other things with that much money and something that precious. Look at your life. Look, you could have gotten yourself out of the mess that you're in if you would have just sold that or done something better with it. Not to mention what you could have done for the poor. You look like a lunatic, lady. You're a horrible sinner coming to the feet of Jesus, and you've gone way overboard, and you've got it completely wrong. No, no, she doesn't. People that think themselves good have a hard time appreciating the passion of people who have been forgiven much. But very simply stated, if we've not had the experience of being forgiven so thoroughly and so completely and so undeservingly, that passion does look silly to us. The passion of somebody like the woman at the well who Jesus basically read her mail and told her everything about herself that no one knew became so excited that she left the most valuable thing she had at the moment, water jars that were going to bring water and keep her sustained in the desert. She left them behind and ran back to town to talk about this man that told her everything about herself. The passion of people like the prostitute in this story, the passion of people like the Apostle Peter, who nearly beheaded someone for touching Jesus when he didn't think he should, who dove naked into the water and swam more than a football field to get to shore to see him because he just couldn't wait for the boat to row up to the into the surf to meet his Savior. People that come to the altar every single time that it's open and they weep and cry and need half a box of Kleenex and you have to bring the carpet cleaner up after the, after the altar service is over. People like me that cry when they preach. It's hard for people who haven't been forgiven much, who think they're good people, to look at people like that in fact, I'm guilty at looking at people that express their faith differently than I do sometimes and finding myself in need of correction for looking down on them. We have trouble appreciating the passion of such people when they've been forgiven much simply because we don't have any point of reference. And as true as that is, the thing that's even more sad is this. It's, it's tremendously unfortunate that we say we can't appreciate that passion because the second thing good people fail to realize is that their little debt is just as impossible to repay as the debt of those whose sins seem so great. The reality is all of us have been forgiven much. The difference is not that this sin is so great and this sin is so small because in the eyes of the Lord, sin is sin. The reality is we've all been forgiven much. The difference is in our own understanding of the nature of sin in the eyes of a holy God. Our small problem with things like I sometimes have a bad attitude or sometimes I'm slow to respond to the Lord or I forgot to read my Bible this morning and that's my great sin that I need help for. But it's, just, but it's small. It's, it's, it really, in the grand scheme of things, that's a little sin. But if I'm walking around with a bad attitude, if I'm witnessing poorly, if I'm slow to respond to the leading of the Lord, that sin is just as serious 
in the eyes of God as murder or prostitution. Sin is sin. And our self-righteousness is just as unrighteous as the worst act of hedonism that we're comfortable watching on television as long as we don't let it happen in our house. We call unrighteousness entertainment sometimes. And yet, pretend we are still righteous. Reality is there are no small sins. There is not a single person in the presence of God who can say, I've been forgiven a little. The difference is very plain. We see it between Simon and this woman. The difference is maturity in our level of self-awareness when we stand before God, who is holy and righteous above all else. We see that comparison in the people that were lent the money. We see it in the difference between Simon and the woman who anoints Jesus' feet, and if we're honest, we should see that in ourselves. We've all been forgiven much, but are we mature enough to realize that that's the case? How do we apply this to ourselves? I've ended each of these teachings with, with that question, and I think I've probably answered that already, but let me ask you two simple questions as I close this tonight. How do we apply this to us? Ask yourself first, who in this parable and in this surrounding account do you really identify with the most, if you're honest? And once you realize who you are, the second question is, what in my life needs to change once I realize who I am? This is the parable of the money lender, told in a way that it still applies to us today. That's what I have for you tonight. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. For this perspective. I thank you for showing us what matters to you, what is valuable to you. I thank you for, for the way that you taught so simply and so easily. And Father, the way that those simple teachings are still so broad. I thank you, Lord, that you can paint the big picture, but you can also drill right down to the small one of what's going on in my heart in such an easy to understand way. Thank you for the way that you've taught and the way that you've presented the truth to us in the same way that you did to Simon on this evening that we read about tonight. I pray, Lord, that this evening we'll be honest with ourselves and that your spirit will work in our heart to show us who we are and what we are and show us how we can apply what we've learned here about forgiveness and about grace, first to ourselves and then to the people around us that you've told us our hearts should be open toward. In whatever way it is that they are poor, let us see the people around us that are this marginalized group whether they're physically sick, whether they're financially poor, or whether they're simply morally bankrupt and in search of something to stabilize themselves that they don't know how to call it by name. Let us see them as you see them, and let us apply the same grace and mercy to their situation as you have applied to ours. We love you. It's been good to be with you. Look forward to the next time that we're together. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. It's good to be with you tonight. Thank you if you were here. <laughs> Thank you if you were there. I'll see you again very soon.